Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today is Saturday, November 21st, 2020. It's also day three of the eighth annual JFK Assassination Conference being hosted by Judith Barry Baker. If you're just joining us, I'm here to tell you that the first days of this conference were absolutely amazing. And I can tell you at this point, we're only halfway through the conference and we have lots of amazing speakers yet to come. I opened the conference by posing this thought. Lee Harvey Oswald was murdered before he had the opportunity to stand trial and prove his innocence. Now, many of us here know in our hearts that Lee was innocent. And what I've asked you to do as our attendees is to serve as the jury, the jury in the court of public opinion. And at the end of this conference, I'm gonna ask you to analyze the evidence that's being presented here today as if this was a court and render your verdict as whether you believe that Lee was guilty or whether you believe that he was innocent as charged. I believe that a first year law student could have exonerated Lee Harvey Oswald with the preponderance evidence that is out there then and certainly out there now. But anyway, I'd like you to listen carefully and closely. And again, at the end of this conference, render your verdict. As usual, Judith is, uh, gathered an impressive array of speakers and witnesses and researchers. And this year, we're going to be spending some time attempting to bring some of the humanity to Lee Oswald, to have Judith help us better understand who this man was. One of the things that's been said, and I believe it firmly, is that Lee Oswald didn't kill JFK. He gave his life trying to save him. And that's a hero in my book. Now, something that Judith wanted me to announce is that we've been having some technical difficulties. Judith's had some major problems with her computer, and so we haven't been able to do things in an orderly fashion that we would have liked to have done. And one of the things that we want to do is make it as <clears throat> easy as possible for you, your friends, <clears throat> your acquaintances, your family to join us. And we've had some issues in being able to do that. So what we're going to do to make it possible if you have family, friends, coworkers that you'd like to be able to attend the rest of the conference is to uh, go to this email address, jfkconference at yahoo.com, make a donation of any amount, and then send an email to relentlesspete26 at gmail.com. I'm gonna put it in the chat so you won't have to worry about whether you heard me correctly or not and just invite them to come and join us to be a participant in this conference. This is historic. This is our first ever virtual conference. And I was a little concerned, I'll be honest, when we first started with this concept of whether it would be as valuable as the conferences that I've attended in Dallas Live. And I have to say, yes, I do miss the personal touch of being there, but as far as the information that's being relayed by our speakers, our witnesses and our researchers has been second to none. And I've enjoyed it. I think you will too. And I think they will as well. So let's see. Well, ladies and gentlemen, are you ready? Shall we bring on our first speaker? I think we should. Our first speaker is Vince Palomara. And anyone who attended our 2016 or 2019 JFK Assassination Conference will remember him. 
Vince Palomar is a civilian secret service expert and the author of five books, including his upcoming book, Honest Answers About the Murder of President John F. Kennedy, a new look at the JFK assassination, which will be coming out in early 2021. Today, Vince is going to be giving us a brief overview of his books, including his upcoming work that tackles the assassination from a 21st century perspective. The title of Vince's presentation is The JFK Secret Service and the Assassination, a 21st Century Perspective. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Vince Palomara. Welcome, Vince. Oh, thanks. Good to be here. I really appreciate the introduction and uh, thank you everyone for watching. And uh, yeah, I guess we'll get started here. Um, I'm the author of five books. I have one coming out next year called Honest Answers about the murder of President John F. Kennedy, a new look at the JFK assassination. And this is a book that I view as like a GPS through hundreds, if not thousands of books, articles, whatnot on the case. And it distills what I consider the best evidence of conspiracy. It eliminates theories, eliminates tangential material, gets right to the heart of the matter. It's almost like the case for conspiracies on trial. And somebody wants to say, all right, Vince, cut through all the muck. I want to know, no theories, no this, that, the other. Was there a conspiracy and who did it? And I lay out who I think did it and all the evidence of conspiracy. And there's new information in it too. It's not just a rehash. So with that in mind, I'll start. First book was uh, Survivor's Guilt, The Secret Service and the Failure to Protect President Kennedy. This came out in 2013. And this encompassed roughly phew, about 20 years of primary research um, not just digging through, uh, you know, National Archives and JFK Library and whatnot, a lot of um, documents, but actually uh, interviewing and corresponding with many of President Kennedy's Secret Service agents, as well as sundry White House aides like Dave Powers, who rode in the fall cars we know in Dallas, and uh, motorcade occupants, whatnot. But the vast majority was, uh, I'd say, about 90 to 95% of President Kennedy's detail I interviewed. This is years. Actually, the bulk of this work was done years before Gerald Blaine's book, The Kennedy Detail, came out, and any Clint Hill's books. Even though it was published in 2013, this was in, it was available in like self-published uh, versions in the late 90s and early millennium. So again, it's just, so you can compare and contrast. You know, these guys were speaking to a total stranger on the phone or in writing. They're being honest. They're telling me what they're telling me. It wasn't a question of, uh, you know, they had some sort of bias. In my opinion, Gerald Blaine had a tremendous bias in his book instead of Clint Hill because they did not want the Secret Service, especially themselves, to look bad. So everything was geared in a very biased light. Whereas the, my work is basically the truth of the bark off. This is what these guys said. This is what they wrote. This is what they felt. And I compared it and contrasted it with prior trips and again, documents, whatnot. And, and you know, so it was you know, before, during, and after the assassination. But just to get into some specific details. One of the major um, one of the major sticking points when it comes to the Secret Service is that supposedly President Kennedy ordered the agents off the car. You know that was the big. If you ever read like William Manchester's book, Death of a President, Jim Bishop's book, the Day Kennedy Was Shot, obviously the Warren Report, and other books like Gerald Blaine and Clint Hills, you get the impression that wow, it's really a shame President Kennedy. You know what happened to him, but boy, you know, in, in small respect, he sort of had it coming to him because he didn't want this protection. I found that this was total bunk. And this, this is from the trip before Dallas. This is the Florida trip, this four days before. This is Chuck Zaboro, Don Lott riding on the rear of the car, President Kennedy, George Smathers, uh, George Smathers, Don, uh, Sam Gibbons, there's Floyd Boring, there's uh, Bill Greer, the driver. But again, this is a normal function. And here's a color photo four days before. And there's Chuck Zaboro, Don Lawton, walking, jogging with the car. And there's uh, JFK. This is actually taken from the FOB car, by the way. That's the top of Sam Kinney's head, the driver of the FOB car, who was also the driver of the FOB car in Dallas. Well, you know, everybody talks to you know, about like, like Clint Hill or not Clint Hill, uh, David Lipton. Got the secret stars in my David Lifton's book, Best Evidence, and he always talks about the Cybert and O'Neill report, was his big 
a moment of truth when he said, wow, this is unbelievable. Surgery of the head area, namely in the top of the skull when he read the Cyber and O'Neill report. Well, September 27th, 1992 was a day we'll live in infamy with me. Up to that time, I begrudgingly started to think, well, maybe there is some truth to President Kennedy didn't want certain things done. But I still thought the Secret Service was negligent in spite of maybe perhaps the president's wishes. So I spoke to Gerald Bain, D-E-H-N, the head of the White House detail. This is the number one agent. He was there from 1939 to 1967, FDR to LBJ, but he was the head of the White House detail during the JFK years and part of the LBJ years. So if anyone would know anything, he would know. So I nonchalantly, I spoke to him. I just basically said, you know, I've read some books, sir, and I've read William Manchester's book one night. I understand President Kennedy did not want your, you know, agents on the back of the car. And he stopped me in my track and says, I don't remember Kennedy ever saying anything about not having agents on the back of the car. If you look at the newsreels and whatnot, you'll see agents on there from time to time. I was floored. I got caught in mouth. This recording was, uh, you know, it was, I was recorded recording it's on YouTube and whatnot. He gave me permission to record and whatnot, but um, gentleman passed away like seven months later. Thank God I got him on tape because no one will believe me. People were like, how do I know he really said that, Vince? So the bottom line is he adamantly denied that President Kennedy ever ordered the agents off the car. This is the number one agent. Gerald Blaine of the Kennedy detail is a buck private. This guy is, you know, the General Eisenhower, the Secret Service, so to speak. So if anyone would know, he would know. But after I got off the phone with them and tried to collect my wits, I said, this is amazing. But at the same time, I always think of devil's advocate. Ah, you know, Vince, think about it. There's going to be people saying, how do we know this guy was an old and senile? He was perfectly lucid. But you still think of it from a standpoint of let's get corroboration on this before we get too carried away. And lo and behold, the corroboration came. This is Floyd Boring, his assistant, the number two agent of the Secret Service, White House detail. He served from... FDR to LBJ. Okay, again, Hunter Buck Private. He worked hand in hand with Gerald Bain. He stopped me in my tracks and said, Oh, that's not true at all. President Kennedy was a very nice man. He never interfered with our actions at all. So I told him about William Manchester's book where he quotes because he quotes me. I never talked to William Manchester. If anybody ever read William Manchester's book, there's a section where it says that uh, Floyd Boring wasn't offended by the order from President Kennedy. You know, he understood, you know, that's just the way politics are. I'm paraphrasing. But Floyd Boring is telling me he never spoke to him. If you go to uh, William Manchester's end notes, you find, lo and behold, there is no interview for Floyd Boring. So where do you get this information? Turns out one of the agents he spoke to was Gerald Blaine of the Kennedy detail, who I strongly suspect is the person, the agent who planted this. And for the record, in the interest of time, in addition to Gerald Blaine and Floyd Boring, uh, Rufus Youngbud, Robert Bauck, Marty Underwood, Dave Powers, Wynn Lawson, who was the head of the Dallas Advance, Abraham Bolden, Bob Lilly, Art Godfrey, Sam Kinney, the driver of the fob car, Pierre Salinger, his press secretary, Sam Solomon, the list goes on. About 20 agents and White House aides told me in no uncertain terms that President Kennedy never interfered with their actions, never ordered the agents off the car. So obviously, $64 million question is, wow. Okay, right after President Kennedy dies, you know, the Warren Report comes out and quotes a couple agents and reports saying that President Kennedy ordered the agents of the car. All these men are telling you, independent of each other, total stranger on the phone or in writing, again, that he didn't do this. Well, why'd they blame him? Well, why indeed? And I think it's just because, you know, they did not want, they keep in mind, this is before, you know, paparazzi, tabloid, you know, internet, whatnot, but still, in the court of public opinion, they didn't want people to think Oswald or Oswald, conspiracy or no conspiracy. My God, the Secret Service failed. We need to end the agency. We need J. Edgar Hoover to take over the Secret Service. And they had their pensions and their whole reputations at stake. So the president's dead. It's very convenient. Ah, oh, President Kennedy orders off the car. And for a very naive America in 63, 64 and on, they bought it. You know, at first glance, it makes sense. Oh, you know, President Kennedy didn't want the agents on the car. The other thing, too, is they never obscured him. Where, where the agents were, for example, again, here they are. Here's the agents. Here's Kennedy. You can see Kennedy as clear as can be. They're not obscuring him. FDR, Truman, Eisenhower all had agents surrounding the car, riding on the car, and no one ever had, had a complaint. They could see the president just fine. There's that. Other major um, discovery, I like to call it, from interviews and whatnot, is most people would think, well, the Secret Service is subservient to the president, the president's boss. But no, when it comes to his security, the Secret Service is the only boss the president of the United States had. 
you might say, where are you getting that? Secret Service is the only boss the president ever had. Well, that actually comes from President Truman. Yes, President Truman vouched for the fact that Secret Service was the only boss the president had. And this was echoed by Lyndon Johnson. This was echoed by President Clinton in public remarks. They all believe this. And more importantly, in an Associated Press article that came out the week before the assassination, it says the Secret Service is the only organization that could tell the president what to do when it comes to his security. Again, this is before the assassination. Uh, Chief Bauman of the Secret Service, which was before Rowley, came out with a book in 1962, one year before, basically said the same thing, that the president knew this fact, that when it came to his security, we had the upper hand. Ironically, Clint Hill, <laughs> I don't know if he was just aiming for posterity. He contradicts all his books. In 2010, he did Sixth Floor Museum Oral History. And he said, well, the president can tell you what to do, but that doesn't mean you have to do it. And what we used to do was always listen to the president and do what we felt was best anyway. He's on video saying this. I showed this at last year's conference. So I think that he did that with an eye towards history. You know, the decades, hundreds of years, generations from now, he's telling the truth. But yet in his books, him and Blaine are kind of like, showing a little propaganda and blaming the president. So with those two in mind, President Kennedy did not award agents of the car and he got the Secret Service's boss, not the other way around. Well, then you go from there. A lot of people think, well, the bubble top, Vince, didn't President Kennedy order the bubble top off in Dallas? He did not. Sam Kennedy, the driver of his follow-up car, was adamant to me on three different occasions that spoke to him in the early 90s. He said, I am the sole responsibility of that. President Kennedy had nothing to do with it. Kenny O'Donnell had nothing to do with it. And I named like four souls was an agent, but I, he was even blamed by Jim Lehrer. He said, no, it's not true. I've had to live with that at the time, it was 30 years. I've had to live with 30 year regrets that maybe that would have made a difference. It turns out through decades of photo analysis and research and whatnot in the archives and a lot of photos have only, <clears throat> excuse me, been released in the last eight to 10 years, thanks to the internet and digital, digitalization, a lot of these photos were not available for many years until very recently. And what they show is based on the president's itinerary from 1961 to 1963 is a third of President Kennedy's motorcades had a bubble top, either partial or full, meaning either just the front and rear pieces and the middle piece was open or the whole bubble top, often in very nice weather, like Bob Lilly, one of the agents, rode on the back of the car in Puerto Rico with a bubble top on. They were reaching speeds of 50 miles an hour with that top on. It was a beautiful, hot day. So it wasn't about, oh, they only use this in inclement weather. Not true. Now, when it comes to Sam Kinney taking sole responsibility for the bubble top, and he was very adamant about this too, by the way. It, I don't think in this case it was a sinister thing per se, just an option not explored. They could have used the rear uh, piece at least, if not the rear and front piece, because many of the agents I spoke to said that the top did deflect the bullet. It was a deterrent. That's why they used it. To deflect the bullet, it would obscure the assassin's view via the sun's glare, the metal strips. And just the fact that most people thought it was bulletproof, even though it was not, was a deterrent. I mean, think about it. Would an assassin or assassins even try if that top was on, despite, you know, obviously obscuring the view, the sun's glare and whatnot, because it was such, it was so ingrained in the fabric of America that that top was bulletproof or bullet resistant at least, that they wouldn't have even tried. So food for thought there. Now we can't rule out the fact that Sam Kinney was influenced by somebody to take the top off. Sam Kinney believed there was a conspiracy. So I have a hard time believing that he had anything sinister to do with it. Yes, indeed. In fact, he had, <coughs> excuse me, he had the rear piece of the back of the president's head. He had that on the C-130 transport plane heading from Dallas to Washington. So he had that piece of, yeah, I saw the back of the head come off when the assassination happened. <coughs> Excuse me. But anyway, so there's that, there's that. And the other thing is about the route. You know, maybe people have uh, heard about, oh, that route was changed, Vince. And there's some people say, oh, that route was not changed. That's the way they had to go. Main to industrial, or main to Houston to Elm. I actually gave something away here. Main to Houston to Elm. And again, I spoke to the head of the White House detail, Gerald Bain, who I spoke before. And he said, well, the High Select Committee asked me two things in High Select Committees. It's still to this day, it's never been released. He was, he was interviewed in executive session and his executive session records are still not released. But he told me in 1992, well, they asked me about the Florida trip. And he also, also asked me why the route was changed in Dallas. And I said, was the route changed? And he said, well, I know it was changed, but why? I forgot completely. I don't know. The bottom line is he's confirming, again, the head of the White House detail, that route was changed in Dallas. 
And I spoke to Sam Kenny. He told me, well, Maine to industrial was going to be the alternate route. And he said, well, you know, it wasn't the best place to take a president, but like I've always said, wherever the president goes, so goes the people. President uh, Kennedy visited the slums of Caracas, Venezuela. He went through Harlem. So it doesn't matter about broken payment and all this other stuff. And one sole source in the Dallas Police Department, George Lumpkin, he was um, involved in military intelligence, is basically the one who throws a damper on that. Oh, there was one who was in broken pavement in the industrial bowl, or that's why we didn't take the president. But again, wherever the president goes, so goes the people. That's hogwash. If they would have went going straight down Main Street, they would have avoided that stupid dog leg turn from Houston to Elm, which slowed down the car and got them closer to the book depository and closer to the knoll. In fact, the last time President Kennedy was in a motorcade with LBJ, the only other time was in Dallas in 1960. And they went Main Street. They didn't go Houston and Elm. They went the opposite way, but they went Main Street. In fact, when FDR visited Dallas in 1936, he also went Main Street the opposite way, avoiding Elm and Houston. And Governor Connolly even admitted to the Warren Commission that the route of going Main Street was the traditional parade route in Dallas. And again, in the interest of time, many, many details on this can be found in my book, Survivor's Guild, the first one. Um, Another thing, calling off the guard, strange omissions. Um, everybody is pretty much familiar with uh, Roger Craig, um, the whole business about Sheriff Decker saying to the Sheriff's Department, in no way get involved in securing this motorcade. And some people always say, always oh, have Roger Craig's word for this. But the thing is, Bill Decker, in a report that's in the Warren Vaughns, again, referenced in my first book, he agreed to offer about 20 additional um, officers, Sheriff's Department, for support to Sorrels. So why does he do that the day before? And he tells Roger Craig, well, I have nothing to do with securing this motorcade. Okay, so there's that. Then you had um, Captain Fritz, who uh, had his men taken out of the motorcade. Okay, Captain Fritz was supposed to have um, homicide detectives in the, in the motorcade. It was taken out the day before, he testified to the Warren Commission. You have Chief Curry, same thing. He was going to have a, a car filled with uh, police officers, detectives. That was taken out. And before anybody says, well, Vince, there was a Secret Service follow-up car. They wouldn't have had a detective's car. Wrong answer. In New York, in Chicago, just off the top of my head, they had a detective's car. They could have a detective's car and a Secret Service follow-up car. So these were um, taken out at the last minute. And this was all by the Secret Service, wasn't by, you know, ghosts and CIA operatives. The Secret Service was involved in this planning of the trip, and these tri these changes were made by them. Uh, General Godfrey McKee was um, JFK's military aide, along with Ted Clifton. He was asked for the very first time not to ride the presidential limousine. He usually rode between the driver and the agent in charge of the trip. In this case, it was Roy Kellerman. I'll get to that in a second. But he was asked for the very first time not to ride in the car, and he was there in Florida. And he said, well, why weren't you, uh, why did they want you there? He says, well, we wanted to offer full exposure to the president. Yeah, see how that worked out. And obviously, for people that know about rearward shots, obviously, somebody not sitting between the driver and the passenger car was not vulnerable being shot and possibly killed themselves. So, and also another professional eyewitness out of the scene. Then you had Stu Knight, who was the head of Vice President Johnson's detail. He was scheduled for a transfer November 25th, okay? Yet his assistant, Rufus Youngblood, was already there in his place. Where was Stu Knight? As Gerald Bain, as I mentioned before, Gerald Bain, who was um, you know, the head of the White House detail, right there, Gerald Bain. He took his very first vacation, timed with the Florida trip and the Texas trip. And not only did agents tell me this years before Clint Hill and Gerald Blaine's book came out, even Clint Hill and Gerald Blaine confirmed in their books multiple times that, oh, it's a shame. Yeah, Gerald Blaine took his very first vacation. You know, it's like a quirk of fate and whatnot. Well, you can decide if it's a quirk of fate. I've decided. His assistant, Floyd Boring, also was not present in Dallas. So it's like take, going to the Super Bowl and using your third string quarterback, Roy Kellerman, to start. Oh, we're not going to have Tom Brady or his backup. What, the third string off the bench, the practice squad guy here? You want to come in here? Roy Kellerman had never been on a trip on his own without Bain and or Boring. He's a third stringer. Okay. Now, Floyd Boring was not physically present, but turns out, and again, this is revealed in Jim Bishop's The Day Kennedy Was Shot, let alone documents and actually speaking to the agents, 
Floyd Boring was in charge of the trip planning from the Secret Service's point of view. And just to tell you up front, I have three agents who I'm very suspicious of, and that's Bill Greer, the driver of the President's Limousine, Floyd Boring, again, who was in charge of the planning of the Texas trip from the Secret Service's point of view, and Emery Roberts, who was the agent in the fob car. Just to let you know, you know, when the shooting began, okay, first shot of shots ring out. Bill Greer, the driver of the car, puts on the brakes, turns and looks at Kennedy, okay? Roy Kellerman, his boss, tells him, get out of line, we've been hit, which is common sense and training. Hello, and yes, they were trained properly back in the late 50s, early 60s. It's none of this stuff about only after the assassination were they trained. They were trained. He disobeys a direct order in common sense and turns back a second time to stare at Kennedy until the fatal shot makes its mark. Only then does he face forward. He lied under oath to the Warren Commission, said he hit the gas after what had been the first shot. Never saw, you know, never uh, caught sight of Kennedy, which is total bunk. He obviously saw Kennedy, could see it in the Zabruder film, clear as a bell. Well, interestingly, Bill Greer died in 1985. Spoke to his son, Richard, in 1991. Again, total stranger on the phone. Now I asked Richard, um, among other questions, warm-up questions, saying, what did your father think of President Kennedy? He didn't say a word. It was awkward. So I kind of stumbled and asked him some other things. And I got back to him and said, sir, if you don't mind, what did your father think about President Kennedy? And he said, well, we're Methodists. And JFK was Catholic. Now, is that a bizarre answer to give? It turns out that Bill Greer was born and raised in County Tyrone, Ireland, and only come to this country about the age of 18. It also turns out, and this is information coming out in the new book, that he was part of the Order of the Orange. And that is in Ireland, um, for years, Protestants and Catholics have been fighting each other, literally killing each other. It's a religious war and whatnot. So for, again, total, you would think he would lie. You know, oh, he loved President Kennedy. President Kennedy loved him. He says nothing. And the second time around, he goes, well, we're Methodists. And JFK was Catholic. And you think back to his actions and actions on Elm Street. And the fact that he was one of the few people that was with JFK from Parkland to Bethesda, you know, the body, he withheld President Kennedy's clothing from the autopsy doctors. There's a reason why I'm suspicious of him. And again, Floyd Boring, not only was he part of the planning of the Texas trip, he also was the agent, despite his doubt, you know, with telling me something different decades later, he was the agent who went to Clint Hill and several other agents said, the, agent, uh, the president doesn't want you on the back of the car in Dallas. And Clint Hill admitted this happened between November 19th and November 21st. That's in his Warren Commission, his Secret Service report was published in the Warren Commission volumes, uh, volume 18, I do believe. You can see, again, my first book has all the citations, all the do documentation for this. You say to yourself, well, Floyd Boring takes it upon himself to tell Clint Hill and several of the other agents don't ride on the back of the car between November 19th and November 21st, lo and behold, November 22nd, Kennedy's a sick, sitting duck and he's assassinated. What a coincidence. And after the fact, Floyd Boring was one of several, just a handful of agents to blame President Kennedy. President Kennedy couldn't defend himself. But well, you know, he orders off the car. And then decades later, the truth always comes out. See what it is, is these guys are old in retirement. You know, the truth's gonna come out in a situation, oh, no, that's not true at all. President Kennedy is a very nice man, never interfered with reactions at all. And they, all these agents told me the same thing. It's like they were reading a cue card, yet they lived in different parts of the country. At that time, in the early mid-90s, I was basically nobody. I had a couple print journal articles that 200 people saw. No one knew who I was. I wasn't published yet or nothing. So why would they lie to a total stranger on the phone and all uniformly to all tell me the same thing? And the interesting thing is, the agents were allowed to be on the back of the car for 28 miles the Tampa trip was JFK's longest trip he ever took domestically. Only the Berlin trip was longer. What do those trips have in common? Agents on the back of the car. What else do they have in common? Building rooftops were guarded. Multi-story building rooftops were guarded with very heavily armed law enforcement. In fact, Russell Groover, who was the head motorcycle officer in Tampa, told me, oh yeah, every multi-story building on that 28-mile trip we had sheriff's departments with, with rifles and submachine guns, Thompson and submachine guns. If any window would have been open, if any untoward action, well, that person would never live to see another president to wave at. So they did all that. And, hmm, Kennedy lives, and yet he gets to an 11-mile motorcade in Dallas. Just 11 miles. looks like less than half, almost a third of Tampa. Oh, they don't have the manpower. Bull. Oh, they had the manpower for 28 miles, but they didn't have manpower for 11. And again, this is something many people did not know at the time. And only, uh, again, it's all documented, especially in uh, 
my third book, The Not So Secret Service, so getting ahead of myself a little bit in the interest of time, but also my first book. I actually show newspaper articles and documents. That it's, it's a slam dunk from FDR, Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy. Building rooftops, multi story building rooftops were guarded. Okay. This isn't just, oh, this is after the fact, Vince. You're going back with rose colored glasses, security they had now. No, I'm saying back then they had FDR. Again, newspaper articles, documents, testimony as well. You know, when I say testimony, agency, you know, corroborating me. Funny thing enough, there was a 1962 book year before the assassination called What Does a Secret Service Agent Do by uh, Wayne Hyde? Long out of print. I got a, a copy about, uh, about 12 years ago or so. In it, it says, whenever the president is to appear in public, agents or police line the street and line rooftop buildings. Like, there it is, the year before. It's not talking about, oh, that's only for inaugural events. That's only in Washington, D.C. events. No, blanket statement. Whenever the president is to appear in public in a motorcade, agents or police line building rooftops and line the streets. There you go. In fact, there was a major article came out that summer, 63, said the president was plenty of protection when he gets to Europe because some people were, oh, no, president's visiting England, Germany, Ireland, Italy. Oh, you know, is he going to be? And they were saying, no, rest assured, you know, the police or agents line those building rooftops. Sometimes a helicopter is even used, too. In fact, the helicopter was used, get this now. The day before the assassination in San Antonio, a police helicopter was up there and it was also filming for at least part of it. If anybody last night saw the National Ge Geographic show, I have it on DVD, called JFK The Final Hours, there was actually a perspective in San Antonio. You could see the motorcade and they're filming. It's from a police helicopter. So they had those resources the day before, but it got doused. Everything's stripped away. Everything's blamed on the president. Um, just in the interest of time, go ahead here. Like, okay, another thing was to motorcycles. When President Kennedy visited Tampa, a trip before, but many other trips, many other trips, it was normal for his car to be bracketed. Okay, bracketed with motorcycles, professional ironier witnesses armed as well. So they're there to obscure assassins. No more from a street level perspective, but they're still there. Okay. When they planned the motorcade, they were planning up to 18 motorcycles, about six to nine on each side. The day before, it's changed by the Secret Service and allegedly President Kennedy doesn't want all those motorcycles, but I can't hear conversations. So they bring it down to four motorcycles to add insult to injury. They're all placed behind the limousine, rendering them useless, useless. Okay, so, you know, six to nine on each side down to four. Um, I spoke to um, several of these Dallas officers, uh, Marion Baker and others and whatnot. And they all were matter of fact about, yeah, they, we were told not to ride beside the car. They couldn't really give me a straight answer why they were told this, but they were, you know, they told me this and, and it is what it is. And again, these are secret service. This isn't like FBI or goblins on the grassy knoll. This is the secret service doing this the day before. And a lot of times they're blaming Kennedy. And now Alan Dulles, ironically, Alan Dulles, who I'm very suspicious of as well, during the Warren Commission testimony, Wynn Lawson, who was the advance agent for Dallas, he asked him, well, were there specific orders from the president to not have the motorcycles by the car? Win loss and testifies under oath. Not specifically in this instance, orders from him, meaning JFK. So wait a minute, time out. You're ordering the motorcycles away from the car based on Kennedy's desires, but now you're admitting under oath there actually wasn't a specific de desire from the president. But then he catches himself because, well, it's my understanding on prior trips, he didn't like all those motorcycles by the car. And wrong answer. High Select Committee, uniquely insecure, as many people have known for years. The High Select Committee reports that it was uniquely insecure what the Secret Service did. Because in the prior stops in Fort Worth, San Antonio, and Houston, and let alone Tampa, Germany, Ireland, Chicago, Hawaii, let's go on and on and on. It's verified. Anybody who visits my YouTube channel, I have many films and photos, photo slides are actually films of Kennedy's motorcades, and you'll see this all for yourself. They're bracketing the car. And again, a man in a building shoots a man in a car. What a coincidence. And yet they're stripping all the security and blaming the president. And years later, they're talking to me and they're saying, oh, that's not true at all. In fact, Sam Kennedy said, that's, I don't know where you read that. That's not true. President Kennedy didn't care about the motorcycles beside the car. And again, I'm trying to keep my composure because I'm like, Sam, do you realize what official history is telling us? Just about the bubble top. He didn't. He was like, I, I'm responsible for the bubble tops removal that morning. Kennedy had nothing to do. And I actually said, are you sure about it? He goes, no, sure as can be. It's one of my 30 year regrets whether I made the right decision or not. And again, it goes down to press photographers. 
usually in front of the motorcade, still in motion photographers filming. Many film, in fact, the, again, the Florida trip, trip before, you don't need Abrams and Bruder and the amateurs. They're all there, AP, UPI, they're all there, okay, filming and photographing. Well, Tom Dillard of the Dallas Morning News testified, and he's also on C-SPAN in 1993, two years before he died, saying, yeah, we were putting Chevrolet convertibles far in the motorcade, it put us totally out of the picture. This happened at the last minute at Love Field. Who did this? Secret Service. And why they do it? Who knows? This is one, this is just ripe for speculation, but obviously it's a sinister connotation. They allowed those flatbed trucks in front of the motorcades and countless motorcades before. But you even see, we need to see the films and photos of his trips to Hawaii, Ireland, doesn't matter. You say, wow, just from that perspective, I could tell this is in front of the limousine. Wow, look how close they are. Like you could throw a tomato, they're that close. Again, what a coincidence. They would have been filming, feet in front of Kennedy. They would have saw the grass, you know, the book depository, everything else, professional eye-near witnesses. In the coincidence that Kennedy's killed in Dealey Plaza, there's hardly any witnesses, but just a few amateurs filming and whatnot. So there you go. Um, so you got that whole business. Then you got Dr. Berkeley, who protested. He was supposed to be near the president, which he was in Florida. In fact, he's, in fact Dr. Berkeley said the only trip in three years he was never close to the president was in Rome. But I got to defend Rome. The security was excellent in Rome. Agents in the back car, many motorcycles, multi store building rooftops. So Dr. Berkeley wasn't close to the car, but Kennedy lived. Yet he was told by the Secret Service to get far in the back of the motorcade. So he's not there. He protested. And Evelyn Lincoln confirmed this to Dr. Berkeley, protested this. He protested this is Love Field. Gerald Blaine in his book, The Kennedy Detail, says only the doctor had himself to blame for being late and getting to the car. It's not true. But he's hoping people reading this book 2010 on will believe it because, you know, oh, it's a Secret Service agent. Hey, this must be true. Gerald Blaine was on the Texas trip, but he wasn't in Dallas. He was in Fort Worth briefly, and then he flew to Austin waiting for Kennedy. He was a buck private. You can't believe anything he says. Oh, actually, I take it back. You can believe what he said to me before his book was published. Back in 2004 and 2005, he was one of the many agents who told me, oh, President Kennedy never ordered us to do anything. It was a very nice man, very cooperative. Whatever you guys want is the way it will be. But then he started seeing my stuff on the internet. I come out with this in the new book, Honest Answers. His lawyer actually threatened me over my blog and I got much harassment from Gerald Blaine's friends. And I know specifically who they are for legal reasons. I'm not gonna name them, but they actually harassed me at work, uh, deleted Amazon reviews of mine, deleted my blogs, many other things. And why did they do this? Why did Gerald Blaine come out of his book with Clint Hill? Why did they do all this? Because they saw what I was doing, a little old amateur me out in the wilderness, especially on the internet before my books came out. And they said, wow, he's putting the blame on us. He's, he's basically telling the truth is what it is, but he's always thinking about, we can't allow this. Hey, you've got to put the onus back on Kennedy. And if you read the, the Kennedy detail, you're left with, my God, it's a shame what happened to Kennedy, but boy, he didn't want this. He didn't want this. He didn't want this. Wow. No truth to it at all. And Gerald Blaine knows it and Clint Hill knows it. Clint Hill knows it because he did that Sixth Floor Museum oral history where he admitted as such, what I said earlier. Oh, the president can tell you what to do, but it doesn't mean you have to do it. What we used to do with President Kennedy was we'd listen to him, but we'd do what we felt was best anyway. He's on video, Sixth Floor Museum, go get it. It's there. I showed it last year, the excerpt on a presentation last year. It's on my YouTube channel and many other locations online. But the point being is that they wanted to come out with these books. It's very to what these guys, Clint Hill used to wear it as a badge of honor that I'm never going to write a book on the assassination. I'm never going to do anything. And why would I do that? And I know where it comes out of the world because I sent him a 22 page letter and the book and the letter is published for the first time in my new book coming out, Honest Answers in March. The whole 22 un, un forget it's the letter. And you can see why he was so angry because I basically laid out what I'm laying out to you guys now, you know, in, in glorious detail and more. And so what they did, they had to circle the wagons. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I'm reading, wow, Gerald Blaine's coming out with a book. Gerald Blaine, who's Joe? I know who Gerald Blaine is, but 99.9% .9 of America doesn't know who Gerald Blaine is. Why would he be coming out with a book? It was supposed to be self-published. And all of a sudden, Simon & Schuster, the number one book company in the world, comes out with it. Whoa. And then his co-author, Lisa McCubbin, had, uh, was involved in Saudi Arabia and was a spokesman for the Saudi Arabian government after 9-11. She's the co-author. Okay, and co-author of all Clint Hill's books. And again, this is public domain. This is not tabloid. It is what it is. Lisa McCubbin and Clint Hill are a couple now. They admit it in their book. Um, he admitted to the Irish Times, Clint Hill did. 
it is what it is, but isn't it funny how to know where a woman who's young enough to be his daughter comes out of nowhere, they're together, they're writing these books and every book they have to go out of their way to say, President Kennedy orders on the car. He didn't want the top on, you know, there's nothing we could have done. As if the other frame was nauseating for Blaine and Hill. Oh, there's nothing we could have done. There's nothing we could have done. Ah, it happened so fast. Oh, it's one man Oswald. How can you protect against that? There were so many open windows. They don't tell anybody about rooftops being guarded and whatnot. In fact, Larry Sabato, who came his book, The Kennedy Half Century, to his credit, he notes me in a footnote. And Gerald Blaine says about the rooftops, he goes, well, we didn't have the manpower to man rooftops in Dallas. But again, that's 11 miles an hour, 28 miles an hour. Gerald Blaine is one of the advanced agents for the Tampa trip. He made sure to have all those multi-story buildings, rooftops guarded. But oh, Dallas, well, let's forget that. And Floyd Boring, tell the agents not to be on the back of the car. Make sure that bubble top's not there. And let's get those motorcycles away. And here's the other thing, it's crazy. Absolutely crazy. And it is what it is. This is factual information. Most people would think a state in the Bible Belt, somewhere down in the South, if the president, we'll go back in time to President Obama, the threat levels to President Obama went up 400% over George Bush when he was inaugurated. Okay. Say he's, uh, President Obama is visiting Mississippi and supposedly there's no threats to the president found. You'd say, come on. Well, when JFK visited Dallas. What did he say famously? I'm quoting JFK. He said, we're heading to nut country now. Okay. There was the wanted for treason posters. There was the John Burke Society. There was the Adley Stevenson incident. The Secret Service claims they found no threats to Kennedy and Dallas. Even Roy Kellerman, to his credit, testified to the Warren Commission. He found that unusual. Most of Avery and Bolden's other agents, they thought the same thing. Seems awfully suspicious they don't find anything. If they would have found something, maybe there would have been more precautions, but the cover story was, hey, we didn't find any threats. So that's how they, I think, got away with it. That was the cover story for everything. They didn't find any threats, so they don't have to take any extra precautions, you know. And then just some, some other things in the interest of time. This is the first time LBJ and JFK were in a motorcade together. The last time he was just a candidate for president with LBJ, and the last time was Dallas. He shoot ahead from September 1960 to November of 63. And the first time they were in the motorcade together as president and vice president, that's a no-no from a security standpoint. Even Belford Lawson, no relation to Winston Lawson that I know of. He was the um, lead attorney for the Secret Service for the House Select Committee, even said, it's the first time in American history a president and vice president were in an open motorcade together. You're supposed to keep them apart in case, God forbid, something happens, but something happened, didn't it? And so there you have LBJ, and even if you don't hold him in suspicion, well, it wraps everything in a bow. It happens in his home state. Now he's there conveniently to be ushered in as the president. You know, you, you got a jurisdictional uh, situation because the, the murder of a president was not a federal crime at the time. It was a local crime. Although Jagger Hoover stuck his neck in, as we know. And again, in the interest of time, some other bullet points. One of the greatest smoking guns in the whole case, in my opinion, is the so-called agents found on the grassy knoll or near the book depository or both. Officially speaking, there were no agents that were on the ground in Dallas. And yet several witnesses, including Joe Marshall Smith, Dallas police officer and others, ran into agents, men claimed to be agents, and Joe Marshall's case is incredible. Guys showed them identification. Officially, there's no agents there. Were they there? And then many people have said for years, maybe it was a CIA spook, Vince, maybe it was an assassin. Could it have been a real agent? And they're guarding his identity or identities after the fact because they don't want to admit they were there. And they also don't want to admit, hmm, why were they there? You know, it's a two-part thing. And in interest of that, Glenn Bennett was one of the agents on the fog car. You might say, okay, Glenn Bennett, so what, Vince? He was an agent on the fog car. He was an agent for the Protective Research Section, PRS. Protective Research Section agents are desk job agents, okay? They check threats to the president. They're not there in the field. They're not there in motorcades. Yet he's temporarily assigned to the White House detail on November 10th. The next day on, he's involved in motorcades in New York, Florida, and Texas. He lied under oath to the House Select Committee. This only came out in the late 1990s because of the Assassinated Records Review Board. I wasn't on the Florida trip. He was um, accompanied by a Secret Service counsel, I guess, just in case you know things got heated in the room, his interrogation, because I wasn't on the Florida trip. So no one in 1978 had any reason to doubt him. Okay, he wasn't on the Florida trip. Well, in the late 1990s, the shift reports come out. He's on every stop in Florida, Palm Beach, Cape Canaveral, Miami, Tampa. 
And yet he lied. Why did he lie? Why indeed? Why was he on all these trips? I think to monitor a threat or threats in progress and the Secret Service covered this up after the fact. That's why he was there in the fog car scanning the crowds. They were looking for threats. This is a moving crime. This was an Oswald in the building. Get serious. Get real. Okay. There was, there was uh, the um, motorcade in Chicago, November 2nd, 63 was canceled. Absolutely no question about that. The shift reports have come out. Late 1990s, thanks to Arab Bean, they all show about how the agents, in fact, Sam Kinney was one of the agents, Floyd Boring was one of the agents. They were all getting ready to go to Chicago to protect the, protect the president, and it was canceled at the last minute. November 18th, again, these doctors only came out in the late 1990s. There were six pages of threats to the president in Miami alone, six pages. And a lot of them were anti-Castro Cubans. And yet he gets to Dallas, nothing, zero, big goose egg. Can you believe that? When even President Kennedy said to Kennedy O'Donnell the night before, boy, last night would have been a hell of a night to assassinate a president. Somebody could have dropped a pistol in a briefcase. And he goes, we're heading to nut country. Marty Underwood told him about rumors. Marty Underwood was a Democratic National Committee advance man. He says, Mr. President, we're getting all sorts of rumors. You know, something might happen to you on this Texas trip. And this is the day before his assassination. And President Kennedy laughs at Marty, you worry about me too much. Henry Gonzalez said the same thing. He was told there's nothing to worry about. Secret Service had taken care of anything. In fact, Jim Lehrer has a famous article, ironically, came out right before the assassination, said, Secret Service, Secret Service is sure, all was secure in Dallas. <laughs> but again, this is before tabloid television, investigative journalism, Woodward and Bernstein, the internet, you know, couldn't dredge photo archives. Give me a break. Back in 63, 64, but like my mom and dad tell me, they six people could have been shooting Kennedy. We were so grieved. All the details went in one ear, not the other. And so that's how they got away with it. That's how they got. It wasn't until many years later, amateur me in the wilderness thought to contact these guys and inadvertently came across all these discrepancies in, in security. It wasn't until the 90s on a lot of these documents came forward. It's only been the last like eight to 12 years. The lion's share, a lot of the thousands of photos I share have become available in a newspaper where I had to pay money to get the newspaper articles to show, oh my God, July 63, it's admitting in Milwaukee, you know, like it's another thing too, specific trips, Milwaukee, the um, Miami, or I'm sorry, the Milwaukee uh, police detectives talking about, or police captain, oh yeah, we have to police all the rooftops on his motorcade. In Nashville, same thing said, they did not rest until the president's party passed, then they relieved in the next building, then the next building. And you ask yourself this, okay, even if somebody out there believes, I think Oswald acted alone, Vince, well, isn't it funny if they would have been guarding building rooftops, abort, abort, there's someone in the book depository right now, they would have been there and either shot him dead or at the very least before the limousine would have turned on to Houston and Elm, they would have been able to stop it, abort it. There's some, you know, expletive deleted with a rifle in that window. So even if you just have a very conservative outlook on things, I think there's one shooter from the rear, you know, let alone being able to stop a multi, you know, multi-level conspiracy with assassins and whatnot. Now, agents that believed there was a conspiracy, Sam Kinney, again, the driver of the FOB car, not only in Dallas, but many other stops, believed there was a conspiracy. And he had the right rear piece of Kennedy's uh, skull on the C-130 plane and back to Washington with a uh, limousine in, in the uh, Secret Service FOB car. One Air Force One's making a solemn journey where he's on the C-130 and he finds the piece. He puts a phone patch into Dr. Berkeley. Whatever happened to that piece, he doesn't know. He goes, all I know was the back of the piece. It was like, it was like a clay pot piece. It was as big as my palm. It was right there. And he saw the back of the head go off. So there you go. John Norris, Lem Johns. He's actually on DVD. Lem Johns has passed away, but he's one of the agents in Vice President Johnson's follow-up car. He came on the DVD, Lem John, Secret Service Man, and he's too, he told me this in 2004, but on the DVD, he says, yeah, shot came from the grassy knoll. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Abraham Bolden, we know, is an adamant believer in conspiracy. Secret Service agent John Marshall told the High Select Committee, for all we know, the Secret Service could have been involved in the assassination. I said, well, who's John Marshall? Oh, he's only the head of the Miami office. Nothing to see here. Again, not a buck private. This is the head of the Miami office who's saying, wow, yeah. <laughs> There could have been a conspiracy involved with Secret Service. Gerald O'Rourke, an agent on the Texas trip, believed there's a conspiracy. Maurice Martineau, the head of the Chicago office, believed there's a conspiracy. Robert Bauck, who uh, Christopher Fulton interviewed, and I interviewed him back in 1992, also was adamant there was a conspiracy. Roy Kellerman, ironically, uh, his wife 
widow, June Kellerman, I spoke to her several times. Roy died in 1984. And she said that Roy accepted that there was a conspiracy, that he spoke to the Hustler Committee and he, his view was, I accept that. And Roy Kellerman's drawings of the wound, sure he accepts it. He's talking about the back of the head being gone. He never believed the single bullet theory. Here you go. Um, in the interest of time, go through a couple other ones. This is my second book, JFK from Parkland to Bethesda, that came out in 2015. And this is like a GPS through all the medical evidence, all from Parkland to Bethesda. I, I corresponded with a lot of Parkland doctors and people on the Bethesda side, interviewed a few like Gerald Custer. I got two videotaped interviews of him and Aubrey Reich and so forth. And what it does is every single statement Michael Perry made, Robert McClellan, every single medical evidence witness, what they said, where the source is, there it is. And it's like there's 20 statements of Robert McClellan saying the back of the head's gone, they're all in here. So that's what the frustrating thing for me for years was reading books and they just say, you know, several, eight, several uh, Parkland doctors said the back of the head was gone or two, uh, nearly two dozen said that the throat wound was an entrance wound. And I'd be frustrated, like, well, who are these? They, they wouldn't say who they were or they'd just be very piecemeal. You know, they'd say, for example, this nurse said this, and for example, this doctor said this. I said, no, I want to know who they all are, and here they are. Uh, what I should briefly before, The Not-So-Secret Service, uh, my third book. Um, this is basically the loose ends for my first book. I heavily document about the rooftops being guarded. FDR, Truman, Eisenhower in early Kennedy days for the assassination and some other very interesting items. Um, one of the things I get to very briefly, it's also in the first book briefly, but it's really in here, is about Thomas Shipman. Thomas Shipman died, he was a Secret Service agent, one of the few agents that drove President Kennedy. He died October 14th, 1963 at Camp David. He died of alleged heart attack. He's the only agent to die from Kennedy's era, let alone before the assassination. At Camp David, he's the only person I found who died at Camp David of allegedly a heart attack. I spoke to his family and he said that he was fit as a fiddle. He just passed his physical. He was supposed to drive the president. He was supposed to be in really good shape. He dies in a heart attack. And that allows Bill Greer to be the driver in Daly Plaza. Well, here's the thing about Tom Shipman. He was buried three days later. No toxicology tests, no nothing. That's a country doctor's catch-all heart attack. When they can't find anything overt, no stab wounds, no gunshot wounds, and they don't take toxicology, heart attack. Come on, give me a break. And he's buried, and there you go. And again, the family didn't rain on my parade. They all said they always thought it was suspicious how quickly he was buried, but Dr. Berkeley handled it. Dr. Berkeley is the one who handled everything, they said. Hmm. And again, guy dies not after the assassination, a month before the assassination, October 1463. He was looking, this is what his family told me, he was looking forward to driving the president in Dallas because we have some relatives in Dallas. So he was looking forward to that. This is really grist from the mill. One of, one of, if not the last trips that Thomas Shipman drove was the Mary Pinchot Meyer estate in Milford, PA. So pretty wild there. And obviously a year later, Mary Myers is killed in the Potomac. So again, my suspicions about Bill Greer, his actions and what he said about Kenny you know, were Methodist and JFK was Catholic. Then you have, you know, Thomas Shipman, who a guy who was scheduled to drive dies. So there you go. And this only came out in 1997, Little Old Me on the Wilderness. I discovered that he passed away. And it took years to corroborate things, to find out who he was, to, how he died. Uh, it was this very obscure newspaper articles I had to pay money for in the Maryland area. It wasn't even the Baltimore you know, Times or whatever their major newspaper is. It was little obscure suburban newspapers that said, Secret Service agent who guards Kennedy dies. It's like, wow, so pretty crazy. Fourth book, Who's Who in the Secret Service, is my top 100 agents from basically McKinley to Trump and all points in between. A lot of Kennedy detail agents are in this. And I give a really good synopsis, in my opinion, of all the security deficiencies with Kennedy. Final minutes, I'll just say that I have a fifth book coming out called Honest Answers about the murder of President Kennedy. Uh, a new look at the JFK assassination is coming out March. Again, Trine Day published my other four books. And it's a GPS of the way that medical evidence book was, uh, the way uh, JFK from Parkland to Bethesda was about the medical evidence. Well, my new book is a GPS through hundreds if not thousands of books and articles on the Kennedy assassination itself. It distills the best evidence of conspiracy. The first two chapters have 24 hard, firm indications of conspiracy. So you just get through the first two chapters and here's a conspiracy to kill Kennedy. After that is 
even more. There's new information in those two chapters, mind you, but there's new information in you know, subsequent chapters and also who I believe did it. And I'm very honest, that's why it's called honest answers about what we don't know the answers to, what my opinion we'll never know the answers to because so much time has passed and whatnot. But um, yeah, it's, it's funny, I didn't think it was gonna be a fifth book. I thought actually really, after the first book, I thought that was it. Then it was like, oh, do you have anything else, Vince? Like I spoke with the medical evidence is unpublished. The dad and the loose ends and, and whatnot led to a couple other books. And then really it was my cousin, Marianne said, yeah, Vin, she's a total layman. She's not a researcher at all. She says, Vin, who killed Kennedy? And I got to admit, I cringed because I couldn't give her a hard definitive answer at the time. So it just sparked me to like, I got to write a book about this. I have to write a book exactly who I think Kennedy, you know, who killed Kennedy who I believe didn't kill Kennedy, the evidence for that, what we do know, what we don't know. That's another thing too. Sometimes people are too sure about their answers and whatnot. I show what is known, what can never be known. But more importantly, I think the first two chapters are worth the price of admission alone because there, right there is 24 indications of the conspiracy. It'd be like if the case for conspiracy is taken into a courtroom. Forget your theories, forget this hearsay. I don't believe this person, they have no credibility. What's the evidence of conspiracy? And that's what I lay out. So. Um, yeah, I don't know if we have, if I have any more time, if that's it, but uh, I can go on any more if you want, but uh, we can later for Q&A. Well, Vince, we actually do have about 11 minutes for Q&A, if okay. you'd like, and I do have some questions. So, Great. ready? Yeah. I particularly like this one. Hold on just a second while I cue it up. All right, here we go. Have you found any reference to Greer and the yellow paint marks on the curb apparently marking a kill zone on Elm Street? No, I know of that. I even like Harold Weisberg way back in the day. There's one book talks about the um, yellow. I've heard of it. It's tantalizing. I don't know if it's proof of anything or not. But and we all, Lord knows, I'm suspicious of Greer. But I never got any co correlation between the two. It's food for thought, though. I can see what somebody said. It almost looks like with the umbrella man being a signal right by the Simmons Freeway sign. The way those paint marks, it certainly leads to suspicion. Let's put it that way. Yeah. But, okay. Next question. Vince, the lack of protection in Dallas, including the press bus being moved back, seems so different and lacking to what JFK would have been familiar with. Has anybody in JFK's team ever mentioned to you about observing this at the time and being concerned as the motorcade was progressing? Do you think JFK would have found it strange or wouldn't have noticed? I think in my opinion, I don't think President Kennedy would have noticed. I think it's also is part and parcel of the whole thing about the agents being on the back of the car. Anyone who sat in even the replica limousine knows, even if you're in good health, to try to turn back and look, forget it. He had a bad back. He didn't know or care whether they're on the back of the car or not. That was their job. So I think with the excitement and the nervousness of the Dallas trip, you know, he said we're heading to that country and everybody knew that Dallas was a tough town, so to speak. I think those are details that he either he noticed or other people put it out of their mind. Yeah, they were too busy, you know, worrying about like the, the crowds on mainstream, whatnot, the, the glorious reception they were getting and for, before the tragedy to really notice things. So I think that uh, unfortunately, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. I think there's certain things they didn't notice at the time, you know, so. Well, here's another question. It's actually one that I've thought of myself. So I'm ha oh, happy good. this person ask it. So I'll get the All answer right. to it, hopefully. Regarding the motorcade route change, Yes. to turn off Maine onto Houston and turn to Elm. Have you ever heard the reasoning behind that, that there'd be no way to get onto the Stemmons Freeway via Maine? It doesn't seem to make sense. What do you know of it? What I know of it is exactly that. I spoke to Jerry Kivett, who was one of Vice President Johnson's agents, and he was there early for the bottling convention for Vice President Johnson. He matter of factly told me on the phone, oh, the motorcade route was uh, put in stone on November 20th which is two days before official history was, was never November 18th. Now, the planning in the early days was four Sorrells and Win Lawson, the two agents involved, four Sorrells, head of the Dallas office, Win Lawson, the lead advance agent for uh, the Dallas trip for the White House detail. And the planning was all to go up to and including Main Street. In fact, famously, there's that one story, um, I think it's in Manchester's book, a couple other ones where supposedly they get to the end of Main Street and says, and that's from here, we enter the freeway. And so, Chief Curry and a couple other dignitaries like Governor Collins said they never knew the exact route. They didn't know it. It was a secret service. They were in charge of just basically following that lead car, Bill Greer. Bill, oh, Bill Greer even said he didn't know the exact route for what it's worth. But the point, point being is 
Now, I do we have Gerald Bain, head of the White House detail, confirming to me that he was asked about the House Select Committee. He says, oh, yeah, the route was changed. He just didn't remember why, but bottom line, wow, the route was changed. And you have Sam Kenney admitting there were alternate routes. Then you have Sam Kenney also saying it was main to industrial would have been the easiest way to go. But again, they didn't give me any concrete reasons. Well, what was the reason why you went this way and why didn't you go this way? I never got it. I never received a firm, you know, why we went this way, why we didn't go this way. It was never real. The closest anybody came was the thing about George Lumpkin to the House Select Committee, um, Dallas police captain who was also involved in military intelligence. And he said, well, there was winos and broken pavement. People have often cited that. The one source they go, couldn't use the industrial boulevard winos and pavement. But again, President Kennedy visited Harlem that year. He went to Crocus, Venezuela. He visited the slums of Crocus, Venezuela on his motorcade. That Paul Landis in the Secret Service report talks about there was uh, the suburban areas of Dallas were filled with junkyards and auto dealers in this typical suburban kind of neighborhood. So not everything was pretty and gussied up. It is what it is. So yeah. So. <laughs> well, I, I would exhort if uh, any of our attendees have any information about that particular talk it, topic, please get it to Vince because it's, I think, something that we really uh, would like to know. All right, here we go. Can you talk about Emory Roberts and some reports that Lyndon Johnson and another agent were talking into the radio in the follow up car? Yes. Well, Emory Roberts, I have three suspects. People say, Vince, what are the three agents you're suspicious of, or the agent, the three of them? Floyd Boring, charged with planning the Texas trip, Bill Greer, the driver of the president's car, and Emory Roberts. Emory Roberts was in charge of the agents in the fob car. He's the agent who famously recalls Don Lott in the famous WFAA ABC black and white footage I've shown on the men who killed Kennedy, Coom Campbell, and whatnot. And you see an agent three times raise his hand like this, like, what gives? And that's at Love Field. That was Emory Roberts who stands a seat and calls him back. He also recalled Henry Ribka before that even began, he was, you could see him in newsreels jogging with Don Lawton. They get to um, the assassination site, going directly to the thing about the microphones. Yeah, you see at the time in the Alkins photo when President Kennedy's like this receiving the first shot, I believe was an entrance wound for the front. But anyway, you see that shot, you can see the agents looking at him. Paul Landis believed the shots came from the front. He said it in two reports, but it looks like he's looking like at the knoll, so to speak, the far end of the knoll. You can see Emory Roberts with the microphone in his hand at that same exact time. It's like, indeed, what, who, who is he talking to? What, what's that about? And then the microphone he's talking to when they get under the underpass, he's hunkered down and he's talking to it again. But the point being, he was in transmission when the shooting began. He was talking to somebody, and it's very telling. It's very telling, not because he's a suspect of mine, but because of what happened to him. After the assassination, he replaces Dave Powers as Kennedy's aide and the one who invites people to go into the Oval Office, he becomes Lyndon Johnson's appointment secretary. Not only have I detailed this in my prior books, in the new book, I have even more information on that, newspaper articles and whatnot, where the press was wondering, what's the Secret Service agent doing these tasks that Dave Powers used to do for Lyndon Johnson early 1965? Well, I got this co confirmed. Emory Roberts is the only agent who has ever performed duties for our president while we still a secret service agent. You're supposed to be apolitical. You work for the Treasury Department and now the Office of Homeland Security. You're not supposed to work for the president. You're supposed to be apolitical. You're not Democratic. You're not Republican. You just guard the office of the presidency, whether you like him or not. And this guy was still an active agent until the early Nixon days. And he's LBJ's appointment secretary. And he put into fact his negligence. He put the fact that Sam Kinney admitted to me he ordered the agents not to move and the shooting began which I detailed last year. He ordered the agents not to move. So now that we have to recall Ribka and Reddy, or I'm sorry, Ribka and Lawton at Love Field and recall Reddy during the assassination, he orders the men not to move. And Sam Keyes, well, exactly right. Exactly right. I'm involved in that too. Well, he did that because, you know, they, they could have been hurt too by lunging forward. And like an agent spoke to me, he said that we're not supposed to care about our own safety. We're there to guard the office of the presidency. We're supposed to lunge forward. That makes no sense at all. Clint Hill ran forward, didn't he? But Clint Hill was assigned to Jackie. He wasn't assigned to... JFK. So Emory Roberts is definitely one of my three guys. And that microphone thing is very suspicious. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would say so too. And, and just so much activity that just seems to, to warrant a deeper look into it. And uh, to me, it seems very guilty. Here's another question. Uh, have you read that Clint Hill related that Bill Greer pointed a pistol at him as he climbed onto the back of the limousine? Perhaps Greer was thinking Clint was not a Secret Service agent. No, I've, I've, I've heard that. that's more like urban legend stuff. There's, there's no truth to Bill Greer shooting the president. 
this is one of the things I talk about in the new book. There's a couple of things that are just like soundbite. Maybe they're just like sexy to the, like the average person in the street. Hey, I heard the driver shot Kennedy, or I heard that agent in the fall court accidentally shot him. There's no truth to it at all. Bill Greer in the Zapruder film, a clear copy of the Zapruder film, he doesn't have a pistol aimed backwards. Jackie Kennedy sent him a letter thanking him for his service to the president, although privately she did criticize his driving skills or lack thereof. No eyewitness saw this. It's all just, they saw early on Roy Kellerman's glistening forehead from Bro Cream in the bad copies of the Brewer film. It looks like a pistol if you really want to think it like, oh, it sort of looks like a pistol. If you want clear copies of the Brewer film. There's no, his hands are on the steering wheel. Now he did slow the car down. He did look back twice. He did disobey a direct order and he's one of my suspects, but he didn't shoot the president. No. No. One last question, uh, Vince. Some of the people involved, I'm thinking they're talking secret service, thought they were protecting the country by removing the president. Who would have been the people who did not feel this way inside the secret service? Oh, well, I'd say 98 to 99% of the agents were fine. They were just following orders or they were quote unquote innocent. It's only three agents I'm suspicious of. It's Bill Greer. Even Gerald Posner's come out. He's the key to the success of the assassination. He said it in 1993 on CBS to Dan Rather. That that's, he's the key. So even a lone nut author even admits that Bill Greer is the key to the whole thing. Floyd Boring, charged of playing the Texas trip. He orders the agents not to, you know, to get on the back of the car and some other things. And then and he was also involved in the limo inspection where the bullet fragments and skull fragments all appeared that night. And then finally, Emory Roberts, for the reasons we said. But the other agents were either following orders from the from two of those three, or they were quote unquote innocent. And you know how you can gauge their innocence. Paul Lannis, who was on the fall car of Clint Hill, wrote two reports saying the shots came from the front. And when he was interviewed with the House Select Committee, he didn't want to deal with them. He just said, I I confirmed the veracity of my two reports. And that was it. And that was 1979. So he's actually got on record three times, basically, the shots came from the front. Uh, four Sorrels, agent in the lead car, I believe the shots came from the front. So that's a long winded way of saying I only think three are involved, but that's a heck of a lot to be to undermine everybody else. You know. Very good. Thank you, Vince. Ladies and gentlemen, give a round of applause to Mr. Vince Palomar. No, he's not going to hear you, but he can feel you. Thank you, Vince. Appreciate you being here. Hey, thanks a lot. Hey, take care. One, appreciate one it. add little thing is actually one of the questions that was involved is at last year's conference, I had the opportunity to speak to Vince and I asked him how he became interested in researching the Secret Service. And he told me, and correct me if I'm not correct, that Penn Jones Jr. told you to pick a topic and then research the hell out of it. Yep. He's and the reason I wanted to bring that up right now is that I'm hoping someone who's watching this video either today or sometime in the future might be inspired to research JFK's assassination and take Penn Jones Jr.'s suggestion to research the hell of it. Become an expert like Vince Palomar has become on the Secret Service. There are a lot of topics that are open out there that you could yourself become an expert on. Earlier today, I said at the end of our conference, I was going to ask you to render your verdict as to whether you believe that Lee Oswald was innocent or guilty as charged. I'm also gonna ask you to render your verdict as to whether you believe Lee Oswald was alone, there was